This morning, I want to look at some of the, the, the doctrines or the ideas that we consider to be most important. Again, I want to give you a little bit of a background to why I am sharing this. I know that all of us, we encounter other Christians who hold to ideas that are different than, than, than the, the ideas we hold to. You know, we think of some of the doctrines, like the doctrine of God. If I use that as an example, which is probably the greatest example, because I really believe there is nothing as important, not just in Christian understanding, but in human understanding, there's nothing as important or as significant as the doctrine of God. What we believe about God is everything, every truth <clears throat> stems from and gravitates around that reality of who is God. What I've learned in my years of life is that when you really figure out what love is about and you figure out what are all the ups and downs and all the things people get involved in, what is the real meaning or the real point behind it, you will come to the conclusion that everything is God. Without God, there's no purpose or meaning to life. You live like a butterfly. You float like a bubble for a few days, maybe a few years, and you burst and you're gone. What is the point? What is the meaning? The only thing that makes it worthwhile or meaningful is God. And how we, we, we relate to, to life and how we, we relate to the things that we encounter in life really depends upon how we see and understand God. So the doctrine of God, I'm saying, is the most important doctrine. But if you look at this, in Christendom, some say God is a trinity, three, three persons in one being. Some say God is a trio, three separate beings who are united in thought and so on. And so they are united in, in, in in mind, but not three, not, not one person, not one being. Then you have those who are called um, modalists who believe there's only one person, but he has three different modes. One time he's a father, one time he's a son, one time, time he's the Holy Spirit. Then there are some of us, like all everybody in this room, who believe that God is one great individual, the source and the author of everything. One God, one person, one being who has an only begotten son, who is also divine, and who is present with us by his spirit, which is his omnipresence. So you have different beliefs. And if you get into discussions about this and other issues, like what is sin? What is the nature of Christ? You get into discussions about this, you will find that there are so many differing ideas. And there are some people who say it doesn't matter at all. I saw one discussion recently this week, maybe yesterday, where one person was saying that it doesn't matter. All that matters is if you are saved. And the, the thief on the cross knew none of these things. So they don't matter really. And, you know, that's a challenging statement. You could say if, if it doesn't matter, why is it that we don't only have John 3, 16 as our Bible, or even the book of John, or even the four Gospels. How much do you need, really, to be like the thief on the cross? All that the thief on the cross saw was Jesus dying on the cross. And that's what saved him. That's what brought him to the place of salvation where he could accept Christ. So what do you need the whole Bible for if you take the argument of these people? But God gave us the, 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 the Gospels, the the, the the letters of Paul, the letters of Peter, God gave us the book of Revelation, because being saved is not the only important thing. There are other issues involved in what is going on. And so that's where doctrinal belief comes in. It may not take all of these ideas in order to be saved, but we don't, we don't exist only to be saved. As Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that what? That they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. 
we have been saved. But having been saved, we have the privilege of glorifying our Father and of saving other people. And, and these doctrines are important because some of them, they really turn people away from God. Some of them, they, they so distort the image of God that some part of the time you don't even know what kind of God is this you're looking at. And the way of salvation becomes so confused, people think it makes no sense. So these doctrines are important. So what I wanted to do today is just, just go through a chart that I have prepared when we, we will look at some of these doctrines, some of those that I consider to be most impactful. We look at some of these doctrines and just comment on them from a biblical point of view. One of the things that I feel very happy about, I, 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 am, I am a little past happy. I am, I am, I am overjoyed. I'm ecstatic about it. One of the things that I'm ecstatic about is that our Father has been helping me, helping us to see how these teachings connect to one another. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what the thing about false doctrine. They don't make logical sense. Like, for example, take the doctrine of, of eternal burning hell, which the great majority of the Christian world believes. Eternal burning hell. You have to take this and you have to you have to you have to join it with the doctrine that God is love. Now tell me if those two things make sense. God is love. God cares for you like a mother cares for her baby. And yet God is going to roast you forever and ever and ever. Some people, all they did in life was they told one lie and then they died. And you're going to be roasted forever and ever. And yet you say God is love. False doctrines cannot harmonize. That's what I'm trying to say. What I love and appreciate is that God has been helping us to see how A connects to B, A and B connects to C, ABC connects to D in, in, in a beautiful, harmonious way. This is what I love very much. And I am appreciative of, of our Father. And I'm thankful to our Father for taking us along this road. So I just want to remind us of the connections between these doctrines. I'm going to bring up my chart on the screen and um, we will just go through point by point for our for our lesson, our, our message this morning. I want to entitle it the, the importance of key doctrines. I mean, I know that the word doctrine is a word that you know people sometimes find distasteful because sometimes some people's religion only becomes a, a set of doctrines. There's no life and no heart. So doctrine, the word doctrine sometimes takes on a bad meaning, but we're not going to approach it from that perspective. We, all of us, I am sure, understand that doctrines are the foundation of faith. And faith is a foundation of Christian behavior. So doctrines are important. Now, the first thing I want to look at is the issues behind the conflict that is that, that exists in the universe. Recently, we went through a series of studies entitled The Mother of All Wars. And um, what I want to highlight here today on this chart is some of these ideas that we went through in that series of studies. So I want to look at the series behind the issues behind the conflict in the universe. And I'm going to look at it from the perspective of on the in the left column, I'm going to look at the key doctrines, the doctrines that I consider most important. And then in the next column, I want to put down how these doctrines are interpreted and how they affect the kingdom of God. In the next column, I want to put what I believe to be the counterfeit doctrine or the, the doctrine that perverts the truth. You know, there are it's not just one. There are many of them. I'm just going to focus on probably the, the ones that are most relevant to us in, the, in our context. But there are so many false doctrines for every, every covered teaching in Christianity. There are probably three or four and sometimes many more, even in the Christian body. That's why you have so many, so many denominations. And then in the next column, I want to look at, is there an equivalent in the kingdom of Satan? 
Now, what I mean is there are really two main, let me bring up my um, highlighter, I'll probably use it. There are two main protagonists, if I may, if I may say that. There is, there is God and there is Satan. There's a kingdom of God and there is a kingdom of Satan. These are the two things that dominate everything that is happening. But right in the middle, there is this counterfeit, what I refer to as the counterfeit, because it is it is partway, it's kind of like partway between God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. Really, every lie is of Satan. But why, why do I say it's partway? It's because the people in the middle here, they profess to be teaching God's truth. and to be honest, I'm not going to say they are not Christians. I believe many of them may be sincere Christians, but they are deceived. And because they are deceived, in actual fact, their, their, their work is really helping the kingdom of Satan. All right? They're helping the kingdom of Satan, even though they are claiming to be Christians. So everything that I believe to be correct, I'm going to put in God's kingdom in the second column. And then we look at how this, the third column and the fourth column relate to these key truths. All right. Now, because we are doing it this way this morning, I'm going to also permit any questions relating to what we are looking at. I'm going to ask you not to bring in questions that are kind of like, like off topic. But if, if there's something that we look at that you don't understand, it's important to me that we all understand Please just unmute your mic and just say, Brother David, or something, so I know that you are trying to speak, and I'll, I'll, I'll take your question, all right? So, all right. The, the, the first great truth. The first great truth. Who is God? We could say the identity of God. I know that if, if I look back at my journey into truth, I grew up in a denomination. But if I look back at my journey into truth, I would say my mind began to be open, really open, when I began to look at the subject of God. My denomination, my former denomination, taught that God is a trinity, or, or to be more exact, they teach that God is a trio. They teach three gods. That's essentially the concept I had growing up in that denomination. But when I began to understand, I began to examine this question, who is God? And I came to understand that the one God of the Bible is exclusively the Father. I had to find a way to explain who is Jesus. And I found that the Bible gives an answer. And I had to explain who is the Holy Spirit. And I find a clear answer in the Bible also. So I developed an understanding of God. And I know I'm simply repeating the journey that each of us took. We all went through that journey. But for me, this was the beginning of my, my discovery of the deeper things of God. I realized that I could not have come to understand what I understand today. I believe that by the grace of God, we in this, in this fellowship have a, a cohesive, harmonious understanding of the things that relate to salvation. I think we do. They, they fit together in a beautiful way. And I think this, this began with understanding who is God. So a lot of talking there, but I feel it's important to kind of make those points. Who is God? In, in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, we understand that God is one person. And I'm going to go beyond that and say God is one being. Not just a person, a being. Why am I saying this? Because most of us understand a being and a person are the same. But in Christian theology, in theological circles and philosophical circles, being is different from person. Kind of like how they are now saying that sex is different from gender. They are, they are, they are just definitions to make sense of their doctrines. And what they really do 
is make confusion of definitions. But anyway, we in the kingdom of God, and I'm going to, I'm going to put us in the kingdom of God. I'm going to say that we are in the kingdom of God, and that's not because we are arrogant or conceited. It's because having having done an open-minded study, all of us in this room believe that the path that God has been leading us on is a path of truth. So we believe that by his grace, we are in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, God is one person. God is one being. In the kingdom of Satan, God is irrelevant, all right? Now, when I say the kingdom of Satan, I mean not the relig religious world, the, the, the non-religious world, because I believe Satan's, remember what we said at the beginning, Satan in the beginning, his attack against God was to get God out of the lives of the, 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 the people in the universe. Satan wanted God out. Satan wanted his philosophy and his principle to rule the universe. And in, in, in his principle, the philosophy is every man is his own God. That's Satan's philosophy. Having tried for many years to identify the heart of Satan's, Satan's policy. At one time we said Satan, Satan's policy is hatred. At one time we said Satan's policy is that you worship Satan. You worship false gods. You, you, you go into spiritualism. But ultimately, when you look at the, the, the whole, whole thing and you try to come to the heart of the problem, you find that Satan's key ingredient is every man becomes his own God. Eliminate the God of the universe and become your own God. That is why if Satan were to die tomorrow, the universe would still be full of, of sin. Why? Because Satan's principle remains, which is that you be your own God. So in the kingdom of Satan, God is irrelevant. In the kingdom of Satan, nobody cares about God. Nobody wants to know God or know about God. Everybody is just concerned about himself. I think most of us know that this is the philosophy of today's world. Love yourself. Believe in yourself. It's it's self help, self self glorification, the selfie. Everything is about self, and it becomes more. It's about it's about choosing your own identity, choosing your own course, and it's about nobody tells me what is right and wrong. I am my own God. This is the great philosophy that is taking over the, the planet. So this is how it is in the kingdom of Satan. We believe in one God. Our hearts and our minds are fixated on that great mark. But in the kingdom of Satan, it's the exact opposite. What about the counterfeit? The counterfeit kingdom says God is three in one or one in three or three gods, some version of it. And the first thing you can know, even from this basic level where we are, first thing you can know is that right now your attention is divided. Your attention is divided. And that's exactly how it is in, 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 the, in the counterfeit world. Because the philosophy prevails that God is the judge and Jesus is the merciful one. Even subliminally, people have this problem. You have people confused about whether they should pray to the Holy Spirit. The, 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 the attention is divided because they don't know who God is. You don't have a central focus you have a divided focus. That's the first, the first element of danger that arises from the counterfeit. But let's go on and see how this develops. So in God's kingdom, God is known. God can be known. How can God be known? Because God is, is a single person. We know who is God. And because we know who is God, we can focus our attention on that God and we can come to know God. You know, Jesus said that eternal life is that they might know thee, John 17 and verse 3. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So God can be known in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of Satan, not only is God not appreciated, not wanted, but God is unknown. 
the people who live in that world where self is God, they have no desire to know God and they have no, no, no intention of knowing God and they have no possibility of knowing God because you cannot know God. First of all, you have to believe that there is a God in order to get to know this God and believing you have to have a, have a desire to know this God. You know, in the verse eludes me, but somewhere in Jeremiah, God says, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And he, he, he wasn't really he wasn't really speaking necessarily of coming to know God as a uh, in the same sense that we're talking about. But the principle is true. Nobody can really come to know God unless the person's heart is towards God. As Jesus says, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. So, so in the kingdom of Satan, God is not known. Impossible. What about in the counterfeit kingdom? God is a mystery. God is a mystery. How many times have you heard this statement from those who are Trinitarians or who believe in a three in one God? God is a mystery. How can you know a mystery? The very word mystery means something that is not known by definition the trinity god in the counterfeit kingdom by definition the god of that kingdom is unknowable because they themselves openly and and and, and frequently admit that the god they serve is a mystery a part of their philosophy and their doctrine is that the god they worship is an unknowable god that's why they declare him to be a mystery. Maybe I am biased. Maybe I'm biased towards my own belief. Maybe I suppose nobody is, is completely neutral. There's a reason why we believe what we believe. So of course, those reasons make us biased. But I admit, I do try to put myself in the position of, of, of the people who believe otherwise. And I don't see how you can state that God is a mystery. And in the same breath, claim that you know God. Both things are, are incompatible. They are, they are contradictory. You can't know God and then say God is a mystery. God has revealed himself in his word. And because of this, we can know God. That's what the word of God is for, that we might know him. The, the mystery comes about because of the misconception that God is three in one. When you fail to accept the truth that God says about himself, that there is one God, the Father. When you fail to accept this and you say there are three gods, Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit. Now you have made God into a mysterious being, a three, three headed, three person, three, three, three concept entity. Put him in a place that your mind is unable to comprehend. And the, 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 the psychological response of most people is to back away from the task of knowing God. You get into a discussion with people who believe in the Trinity, and, and many of them, when you start asking the deep questions, they say, that's a mystery. And when you come upon a mystery, what do you do? You do what I did when I used to study the book of Revelation. I came upon those statements that I would meet from from Ellen White or, or elsewhere that says that, you know, all the prophecies, they, uh, uh, all the time prophecies are already fulfilled. I came up on a wall and I couldn't go any further because of these limitations and I would back away. When you come upon something that by, by definition is, is unknown, it's unknowable, what are you trying for? You back away. Like if somebody asked me, where did God come from? I stopped asking that question when I was about eight years old. But I didn't ask it. But when I came to the, 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 the conclusion and, 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 and saw that it is an impossibility to get an answer to that question, I stopped asking the question. Because we don't waste time on things that it's impossible to get an answer for. And so logically, if God is a mystery, logically, when it comes to knowing God, you are going to back away. Because God can be known, because God is known in the kingdom of God, God is trusted. All right, we trust our God. That means 
We have confidence in him. We trust him. So God is trusted. God is known. And these, because it starts with the fact that we know that God is one person. We're not confused about who God is. So we set out to know that person. And there are, there are hundreds of roads leading to the knowledge of God. Hundreds of roads. If you go to the Bible, you can look at the statements in the Bible. You can look at the, 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 the teachings of Jesus. You can look at uh, the, the, the doctrines of how God works. And all these roads are leading to a knowledge of God. It's not difficult because you have only one person that you're focusing on. So you can know that person. And you know, you know what it says in the Psalms. It says, they who know your name will do what? They will put their trust in you. The one who knows your name will put his trust in you. So when you come to know God, you come to trust God. You have confidence in God. In the kingdom of Satan, they have no desire to trust God and they have no cap capacity to trust God. God is rejected. They don't want to know God. They don't want to trust God. They don't need to trust God because they trust themselves. That's what they think. And so in the kingdom of Satan, God is rejected. But in the counterfeit kingdom, there is uncertainty about God. Why? Because even though you know that philosophically, the Bible says we should trust God. But how can you trust who you don't know? How can you trust the mystery? When you ask certain questions about God, God says, I have a son. And you say he's not God's son. You say that God says that his son died to save us. And you say he never really died. It was a human part that died. If God is so ambiguous, we would say he's so two mouthed, he's so, so uncertain. How can you be certain about that God? How can you be certain that the statements that he makes are true and that the things that he promises are absolute? How, how can you be certain that it's not another mystery that you misunderstood? When people believe that one God is pleading with another God, the logical question is what's the point? What's the point? When we find that that Jesus took on human flesh to die when he didn't die. God made a sacrifice and gave his son when he didn't have a son. God gave his son, but he was never really given. He was only lent for a little while and then, and then taken back. What is the point? If you don't understand, how can you? I don't know about most of you, but I think you, you probably are like me. If you look at something and it doesn't make sense, it's like you, if you're a de detective and you're looking at the, 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 the facts of a case, the evidence is laid out before you and the evidence doesn't make sense. Somebody says that they saw this person entering this person's house at that time of night. And all the evidence says that the person was not entering the house. The person was 30 miles away at that point in time. You have a lot of evidence that says the person was 30 miles away. Something is not making sense. You know that something is wrong. And that is what happens in the counterfeit kingdom. There is uncertainty about God because they have started out on a, on, on a false basis that God is three in one and it leads to this, the, the, this confusion about God. You, you see what I'm trying to say, and I hope all of us are able to, to get what I'm saying. What I'm trying to say is that the doctrines are not simply ideas that we float around. They're not simply things we debate and argue about. They have real impactful effects on our lives and on our Christian experience. That's why we argue about these things. This is what frustrates me when I get onto Facebook and I see people arguing interminably about what Ellen White says about God, about statement upon statement, day upon day, month upon month, year upon year, and they never move beyond the debate about who is God? Amen. Where, where, where is the is the point behind it? Where does it take us? That is what enables us to de determine if this doctrine makes sense at all. It is where it takes us. It is what it does in terms of our relationship 
with the God that we argue about. The next doctrine I want to look at, and I'm going to come back to who is God, because of course, maybe I brought up this one about what is sin too early. But anyway, since it's there, let's go to it. But there's more involved in the question of who is God. But let's look at what is sin. In the kingdom of God, that's where I'm putting us. I'm going to say the kingdom of God is where we are. No question. In the kingdom of God, the question, what is sin? We are looking at the question of what is the problem in the universe? What is the human problem? What is the universal problem? Even what is God's problem? If you don't know what is sin, you don't understand what is going on at all. Okay? So in, 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 in the kingdom of God, we say the problem is self. Notice that over on Satan's side of the, of, of, of the formula. In the kingdom of Satan, God is irrelevant because self is God over there in the right column. And, you know, it, 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 it harmonizes. If, if self is God over in the right column, then it stands to reason that self is a problem when you understand things properly. We know that in the beginning, Satan established the kingdom of self, a government based on self. He said that it was a problem for God to rule the universe. God to be the center is the problem. We have been through all of this in our series, so I'm not going to go through that again this morning. But self is a problem. We see the problem that needs to be fixed. It's a self-oriented life. That's the problem that needs to be fixed. In the kingdom of Satan, interestingly, God is a problem. So both things work in correspondence in the opposite way. Who is God? God is one person. In the kingdom of Satan, God is irrelevant. In the kingdom of Satan, self is what it rules. And when it comes to what is sin, it's the opposite. Self is a problem. Self is the self-oriented life is a sin that we battle against. But in the kingdom of Satan, it is God who is the problem. And what do I mean by this? What is it that you see them fighting against today? They are fighting against the limitations that God would put upon humanity. God says, God says, don't commit fornication. God says, don't tell lies. God says, don't tell sin. God says, live by certain principles. God puts, God puts limitations upon your life. God says you cannot indulge the, the, the carnal nature. Something needs to be fixed. You know what they say? And it is most prominent in this, what they call the woke movement today. I'm going to use the word woke because it's more than simply the gay movement. It's the transgender movement. It's the non-gender movement. It's the hundred gender movement. All of this together is where people say to God, you can't tell me what is right or right, what is wrong. Myself, my God, the God of self has told me that these things are wrong and you can't tell me otherwise. They see the problem as God. God is a problem. And that's why there is a growing hatred of the church. Yeah, there, there, it's, some of it is due to the false teachings. But even, even in the kingdom of God, where you embrace the truth, there is a hatred. Because in the kingdom of Satan, nobody must say to me that my behavior is wrong. You must adjust your morality. You must adjust your philosophy to suit my feelings and my desires because self is my God. In the kingdom, in the counterfeit kingdom, behavior is a problem. And you understand what I mean, right? What is sin? They say that sin is the, the things that you do, transgression of the law. Over in Satan's kingdom, they said it's not a problem. Breaking the law is not a problem. I mean, some aspects of it, the government still stands by, but they are, they are gradually eroding it little by little because the demands of self is the greatest element in the kingdom of self, in the kingdom of Satan. So we understand that the real problem is me. 
how do we solve the sin problem? I must die. I am taken out of the way by being crucified with Jesus Christ. That's the answer to the sin problem. But in the counterfeit kingdom, the problem is what I'm doing. So it's not necessarily self that must die. Most of the people who are in that column of the counterfeit, they do not focus on self being taken out of the way. They focus on adjusting their behavior. Many people who live here, they don't see a problem in being hard. They don't see a problem in being critical. They don't see a problem in, in being merciless. But they see a problem in not going to church on Saturday. They see a problem in not paying their tithes. They see a problem in openly breaking the law. But it's not self that they see as being the issue. In, 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 in most other ways, they still live by their own desires and their own principles but only as far as the 10 rules are concerned they try to conform because they think the problem is behavior who is the holy spirit i should have put this i, I should have put what is sin further down i admit i brought it in too early but who is the holy spirit this is another one of the remember we're looking at key doctrines who is god what is sin who is the holy spirit these are some of the things that we we really get into discussions about who is the Holy Spirit in the kingdom of God. We understand the Holy Spirit to be God present here, God present in all places. And I want to emphasize the word personally. I emphasize this because I'm going to I'm, I'm going to show you why I, I need to emphasize personally. So the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit gives us in the kingdom of God, God himself, God himself is with us. In the kingdom of God, God, we can say your body is the temple of the living God. In the kingdom of God, we can say God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. In the kingdom of God, we can say Jesus has said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. We can say he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. All these things are true in the, in, in the kingdom of God. We are not left orphans. We are. We have living connection with our living God and his son in the kingdom of God. Don't tell me that this is an irrelevant doctrine. Don't tell me that it doesn't matter what you believe on this, this, this subject. In the kingdom of Satan, God is absent, of course. I mean, it's almost the same answer for everything over on, on that right column, right? God is not only not here personally, he's absent and he's irrelevant. Over on that right column, they blaspheme. I've, I've, seen, I've seen people look up at the sky and say, if you exist, let me see a bolt of lightning now. No bolt of lightning. They are blasphemers. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in the presence of God. They have learned, are, are, they, they, they have set up a life in which to all intents and purposes, God is absent. Even though, in a sense, we all live in God and we move in God and we have our being in God, but in terms of God's personal presence, no. It's just that the power of God continues to surround and to maintain and sustain everything. But God's personal presence in that, in that personal way is only with his people. We know that God is with us personally. What about in the counterfeit kingdom? Well. There are so many beliefs here. I'm only going to pick on one or two, right? They believe that God is here by a third person, not God himself, not even Jesus himself. They believe that there's another person that we have never seen. We do not know. We cannot interact. We, we cannot relate to somebody who didn't die for us. Somebody is here who is a third person. That That's one concept another concept is that god is here by his angels another concept is that god is here by means of his words by reading the words of the bible you begin to develop god's attitude inside of you in a way you begin to develop god inside of you you develop the spirit of god which they believe is a mind or the thoughts of god you begin to think like god you begin to behave like god because you have absorbed the mind the thoughts and they think this is the spirit of God. Again, this kind of thinking 
takes God away from you. It gives you the angels. It gives you the, the thoughts of God. But where is God? In this thinking, God is billions of light years away in some distant place. Now, this is not, like I said, when it comes to the count of feet, there are several different ideas here as to who the Holy Spirit is. So I just commented on, on two of them. It's not, it, it's, it's, I hardly know where to put these beliefs because there are so many of them. But suffice to say that in the kingdom of God, the truth is that God is here personally. And there is abundance of scriptural evidence that makes us come to this conclusion. Let's move on. When we look at the solution to this problem, the problem of self being God, the problem of sin, the problem of the, 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 the confusion about God, you know, the main ideas that were promoted by Satan, what is the solution? We saw that the great solution, the great element, the greatest element is that God has a begotten son. In the kingdom of God, we find that because Jesus is God's begotten son, God is revealed. What do I mean by this? I mean that the answer to Satan's lie, you know that Satan attacked God by, by questioning, questioning God's character. He said that God is not a person who, who is trustworthy. God is not a person who is a loving person. He made out that it was better to live independent of God because God did not have our best interests at heart like he said to eve god knows that if you eat this fruit you will not die god is a liar god had to find a way to to reveal the truth about himself and he did that by sending somebody who is exactly like himself we know as we pointed out god could not defend himself when somebody tells lies about your character you cannot defend yourself what you need is a witness you need somebody who knows you, somebody who can be trusted to tell the truth about you. And this person is to be revealed. And the, 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 the person who qualified was God's begotten son. Now, listen, if Jesus was God himself, he was disqualified also. Because the reason why God needs a representative is because God cannot defend himself. You see what I'm saying? So if Jesus is God himself, the, 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 the revelation is null and void. I'll explain why. There are certain given, given things about God that are without question. Number one, God cannot die. This, the Bible shows that this is an absolute truth. Number two, God cannot stop being God. If God stops being God, then he's not God. God, by definition, is God. He's the author and the source of everything. He's, he's the great power source from which the universe exists. If God stops, the universe stops. God cannot die. God cannot stop being himself. Thirdly, and because of this, God cannot reveal himself. Why? Because somebody says that God is a liar. God says, no, I'm going to show you I'm not a liar. Somebody says that God does not, is not a loving person. God says, I'm going to show you that I'm a loving person. So God starts doing kindness to his creatures. God starts providing blessings for you. God starts answering your prayers and so forth. And God says, see, I'm a good person. God was doing that all along. And Satan still produced a lie that God is not a loving person. How do you prove yourself? when nobody can put you to the test. Nobody can examine and see if you are, you are pulling a trick. It's, it's, like, it's like an adult trying to trick a little baby. You have so much more intelligence, you can trick that baby easily. If God wants to trick us into believing he's a good person, nobody can see through that deception. What God had to do was to come down, to find a way to come down to our level and to become a human being on our level and to live a true human existence so that you could know that this is not a deception. This is a true human being and God cannot become a human being. That's why it had to be somebody who was capable of being made a human being, somebody who was capable of 
becoming one of us down on our level where we could really see what God is like. Yet, it had to be somebody who could give a perfect revelation. And without going into all the details again, all of you understand why it had to be the only begotten Son of God. Jesus was born of God. Therefore, he has the nature and the character of God. That's why he could reveal God. And yet at the same time, because he was not God, he could be made into a man, born as a man, conceived in a woman's womb or, 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 or placed in a woman's womb as an embryo, grew up as a human being with all the limitations of humanity. When Jesus showed patience and love and compassion, it was not God Almighty that we were looking at. It was God in human limitation that we were looking at. It was the reality of what God is like. That is what we saw. And the guarantee is that he was a, a man and he was also the begotten son of God. That's the guarantee that the, 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 the revelation was real. All right. Some other time, if there's anybody who doesn't understand that, we can take the time to explore that more fully. We have done it already in the past, but just in case. Only in the kingdom of God can we see how God is revealed so perfectly. In the kingdom of Satan, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. They, they don't care to, about God being revealed. It's irrelevant. In the counterfeit kingdom, in the counterfeit kingdom, Jesus revealing God is questionable for all the reasons that I pointed out. How did Jesus reveal God? Because God cannot die. How did Jesus reveal God? Because God cannot be made limited. How did Jesus reveal God? Because he was God while he was man. So the whole thing could have been an, an elaborate deception. There's no way of proving that this is really an objective revelation of God because it was so easy for Jesus to deceive. If you believe that Jesus was God Almighty, it was so easy for him to I think I need to mute everybody. I know that this is a little bit um, complicated, but I hope we're all able to follow. The next thing is Christ's nature. Now, if you notice in, the, in this right left column, these are the doctrines that we always get into discussions about. Those of you who, who, who get on Facebook sometimes, you'll see that these are the things that always cause a big argument because there are so many differing opinions. That's why one of the reasons why I want us to see that there is only one way that the truth can make consistent sense. That's what I'm really trying to say this morning. The nature of Christ in the kingdom of God, when you get the nature of Christ right, you see that humanity can be justified. How so? What is it that justifies us? It is the death of God's son. We are justified by the death of God's son, by what he, he, he did in, in giving his life. God cannot die. Jesus did die. If you say that Jesus, that, that the nature of Christ was that he was divinity, he was God himself. Some of them say that God was, that, that God was hidden. Jesus put his divinity to one side and he never used his divinity. But he was divine just the same. Again, it, it, it's, it's a nonsensical statement because God cannot die. What you're saying is that Jesus partially died. And the only part that died was the son of, of Mary. And how did the, the, the death of a human body save you from your sin? How did the death of a human body save you from your sin? While, while a half of Jesus, the divine half, was alive and well and, and, and in some other realm while the body suffered and died. It, it, it does not make sense. But these are some of the mysterious conclusions you come to. When you fail to accept the simple statement statements of the bible over in the kingdom of satan of course it's, it's irrelevant they say we don't need a savior okay we, we are not sinners we don't need a savior they don't even look at that problem over in that kingdom but in the in the in the counterfeit kingdom what we have as i as i pointed out 
is what I would refer to as an illogical justification. It doesn't make sense. Okay. If you even even if you if you believe in the in the Trinity, the the belief, the idea is that God made a law. You broke the law. God said you have to die for the law. And then God put himself, God gave himself to die to satisfy God because you broke God's law to satisfy the rule that God made that you must die. Everything is kind of so confused. It's illogical and unreasonable. God made a law that you must die. Then because you must die, God says, okay, I will die for you. To satisfy who? To satisfy myself. I die to satisfy myself because you broke the rule that I made. If that makes sense to anybody here, you have a far more convoluted mind than I, I understand. But it's illogical. It's a kind of justification that does not make sense. Yet people, people accept it. And I would say, you know, this is what I would say. The whole reason why something like this is accepted is simply because of this word. This one word is the reason. This covers everything. Okay. When you ask certain questions, trying to get at a reasonable answer, they will say, you cannot understand the things of God. They will say, they will compare you to a, a, a mouse trying to understand a human being or, or, or an ant trying to understand a human being. And they think that that answers the question because they cannot answer it. They, they hold to the false idea. And because they cannot answer your questions, they say, we hold to the false ideas, but we, we label it a mystery. What you are presenting answers the mystery. What you are presenting makes logical sense, but they can't accept what you are saying because that's not the way they have been, been, been educated. And so they reject what makes sense and they hold to something that needs a, a, a mystery to even begin to comprehend it and they hold to it because that's where the tradition leads them. The second Adam, in the kingdom of God, because Jesus is the second Adam, he is able to vindicate. I hope everybody understands what the meaning of this word vindicate means. It means he, he defends, he proves, he justifies God's government. So God's government is God being here personally. God's government is Christ in you, God living in you. Satan said a better government is God expelled. You live by yourself, it's a better government. And that's what he's pushing over here in Satan's kingdom. A kingdom without God, a kingdom where self is God. And Satan says it's a better kingdom. But Jesus came, the second Adam, and he is in the process of vindicating or proving the greatness, the perfection, the sufficiency of the kingdom of God. The only way he could do this was that he had to become the second head of the human race because God's government is going to be proven through humanity. Hum the, the human, the church of God, the church of Christ is the kingdom of God in which his principle of government is going to be displayed to the universe. I'm studying that, I'm studying that, and I'm wanting to understand it better and better. And I'll even say a little bit about that this evening. But God's government is to be vindicated. And the only way is because Jesus became the second human, the second Adam, the second head of the human race. In the kingdom of God, that's how we understand it. Of course, in Satan's kingdom, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Those people on that side don't care. But what about in the counterfeit kingdom? In the counterfeit kingdom, where they believe that behavior is a problem, if behavior is a problem, then what is the answer? It's, it's behavior is the solution. And because God is not here personally, God is here in his words or by his spirit, do you know what is, is being focused on? Man's ability. Man's ability to keep the law, man's ability to do good, 
If you do good, God will bless you. And if you don't do good, you will be cursed. And so a great emphasis is laid on man's ability. Man can do this. Yes, they say God helps us. But listen, we believe it is God in us doing the work of God in us because we give ourselves to him. The problem is me. The problem is self. So we, we, we give up self. God lives through Christ. And God's kingdom is glorified. God's name is glorified. But in the kingdom of the counterfeit, it's man's ability. It's a proof that man is able to do. Jesus came to be an example to us. And so we follow that example and we can do like Jesus did. And so what is glorified is man's ability. That's where you end up in the counterfeit kingdom. And look, I am aware that I'm kind of focusing on one, one, one line of belief i know there are many lines of belief in that counterfeit kingdom many there are so many different ideas i'm actually focusing on, on on some that i encounter more often in my circles the legal minded christians are focused on man's ability man is the center of this religious religious environment not god if you look if you look at the left column what i see as a great value of the left column is that in everything the set the focus is on god what god has done what god does how god's how god is is the whole answer to the problem the final thing i want to look at is the ten commandments and i know that this is not even relevant to many people but again i would say in the environment in which most of us are this is an argument that comes up a lot of the time. And it's a key doctrine because it, 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 it helps, it, it, it makes us need to understand the place of the law. What, what is the place of the law in this whole scenario of how God deals with sin and what God has been trying to do? What is the place of the law? In the kingdom of God, we understand that the law was a temporary system of government. Of course, in the kingdom of Satan, it's irrelevant. They don't care about the law. As a matter of fact, most of, it, most of, in most of the places, they have rejected the law. They have abolished it. On a personal level, on a government level, on a national level, the law of God, meaning the Ten Commandments, is completely irrelevant. And where it becomes relevant, it becomes relevant only in the sense that they set out to, to reject it and, and to abolish it. In the counterfeit kingdom, and again, it's just in the, in the environment where, we, where I am. I know that among the evangelicals, among the Pentecostals, among the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the law is something that was abolished. I don't believe it was abolished, but I certainly also don't believe what those people that we get into these arguments with, those people in our environment, I don't believe what they believe. They believe that the system of the law is God's eternal government, that the law was the issue in heaven, that the law is the issue today, and that all that God is trying to do is to vindicate or justify the law. They see the law or the Ten Commandments as a center of everything that is happening. We believe that the Ten Commandments were a part of a temporary system of government. What is God's system of government? God's system of government is God personally here living in you through the second Adam who is God's begotten son. This is how God governs his people and through his, his church. It is hands on. He comes to live inside of you and he says, my son, give me your heart. And when we give our heart to him, God works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. This is how the government runs in God's kingdom. In the counterfeit kingdom, they say, and, and, and so we know, we know that the law itself was never God's permanent way of governing his people it was temporary 
But in the in the counterfeit kingdom, and I mean this is one part, one side of it, not everybody, but the side that we get into arguments with most of the time in, in, in that part of the counterfeit kingdom, they believe that the law is God's eternal system of government. The rules are there, and God says, obey, and you obey, and if you obey, you live and you will be blessed. It's your response to what God says. It's not God carrying out his, his will and his purposes inside of you through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. No. The word in, in, this, in this place here, in this place here, for the most part, what we have is a religion that is largely based on the words. The words, the letter. Yes, that's how the Bible puts it. The letter and not the spirit. You have a system of belief that is based upon, is based upon God being distant to some extent. Whether you say he's a mystery or you're uncertain about him or you think behavior is the issue or you think there's a third person in this whole scenario in the middle here, God is missing. And what you have to do is find a way to interact with God, even though he's missing. And so that, is, that space is largely filled through the words of the Bible. They look upon the Bible almost in an idolatrous way, as though they believe that the Bible is God's. Brother David. Yes, Brother Sam. Question. Um, let's, um, I have all the time. I'm trying to get it straight in my mind. I know the Ten Commandments was not in heaven, but I realized yes. that every government must have a law. And I come to the conclusion that the law of love was the law in heaven. Yes. The problem I'm having now is when I get to Revelation, when they say God's people keeps the Ten Commandments. Now, if the Ten Commandments have been, they weren't done away with, why is always say the people in the last days was those that kept the commandments of God? I know, I know we're gonna do it because Jesus. Well, we're not gonna do it, but Jesus is gonna do it in us. That means that He is doing it, and and, and we are not doing it. Is that right? All right. Yes. Um. Okay. I'm just I'm just about at the end here, brother Sam. So I will respond to your question. And then I'm going to close off because I know that I'm over my time. But let me respond to your question. There are two things. There are two things to remember in the book of Revelation. And by the way, Revelation is the only book in the New Testament where you will find a focus on the commandments. Now, here's the here's the thing. There are two things to consider. Number one, it does not say the Ten Commandments. I noticed you said the Ten Commandments, but you cannot find the Ten Commandments mentioned in those statements in Revelation. It says the commandments. That's the first thing, okay? So I know that Adventist teaches the Ten Commandments, but the Bible does not say this. There are several places in the New Testament and especially in the writings of John. And remember, John wrote the book of Revelation. There are many places, several places where John says, where, where John emphasizes that Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you love one another. So that, that, that is said in the book of John. It's said in 1 John chapter 3, this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us command. So it's an assumption that it's talking about the Ten Commandments. I don't believe it's talking about the Ten Commandments. It's talking about those who are listening to what Christ is saying and they are responding to Christ. This is what it means to keep the commandments of God in the context of the new covenant. I keep the commandments of God. So do you. But it's not, it's not by focusing on Ten Commandments. It's by responding to what Christ is saying inside of you. If Christ tells you, do not eat this, will you eat it? No, you won't. You are listening to his commandments. If Christ tells you to, to, to go and have a Bible study or God tells you, or he tells you to go and visit this person, will you do it or won't you do it? The issue is having a living relationship with the Lord where you are keeping, you are hearing his word and you are responding. It's a living relationship and not a relationship based on the letter. If you look at John chapter 14, Jesus says in two verses, verse 21 and verse 23, he says, 
Um, he that loveth me is he that keepeth my commandments and my father will love him. And we will come and make our home with him. Then in, an, in, in the next verse, he says, if a man love me, he will keep my word. And I will love him and I will manifest myself to him. The two verses are saying the same thing. But in one verse, he says, keep my commandments. In the next verse, he says, keep my word. So both these verses put together shows that when he says my commandments, it means his word. If I said to you, brother Sam, I want you to do what I command. You would not think of 10 commandments. You would listen to see what am I going to say next. The only reason we, we, we think of 10 commandments when the Bible says commandments is because of the way we have been cultured to think. We have been made to think that every, every place you see commandment, it means the 10 commandments. But the word commandment simply means my instructions. And Jesus made it clear that he's talking about his words. So that's what I would say to that, brother Sam. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question, brother. brother. Yes, brother, yes. brother Andrew, go ahead. I had held up my hand in electronically because I didn't want to interrupt. Sorry, I don't have the, the new go to meeting, so I please interrupt. Very well, that's fine. Um, I, so I understand that you're presenting a macro sketch in terms of the issues behind the conflict. Why don't you have the nature of the, the kingdom or the nature of the conflict? up there as one of the, the major doctrines that influence everything i i i it's because i think in discussing the key doctrines it would automatically be uh, uh it would automatically come in as a subheading even though it's, it's it's at the top but it's also partly because when i get when i look at the discussions and the arguments people get into that is not one of the topics it, it, it's, it's always there in the background, but they never identify it as one of the topics. It becomes clear that it is the macro topic. When, you, when, you, when all of these come together, you see that it is the overriding thing. But you don't see it immediately. If you just start a discussion on that topic, you don't see it immediately. It's when you start looking at the individual things there, you see, okay, that's the real issue. So uh, as we discuss it, I, I've thought that, you know, probably that aspect of it will come out. So I was really looking at the doctrines that people really label and get into. Brother David. Yes, Brother Ray. Um, I, I would also add that um, in my inspiration, I would, when I say the word commandments, in my life, I would take it as to me um, thoughts and inspiration. My, my thoughts, keep my thoughts, my inspiration, my leadership, because if Christ is in you and he leads you, that's how the commandment, those are the thoughts and the leadership and the inspiration, not just merely words. Yes, Brother Ray, I, I agree, I agree, I agree. Um, some people, well, I would say that, you know, I don't like to label people, but the Bible says that, well, it doesn't call them legalists. It's a, it's a, it's a modern name, but I will tell you that legalist is a good term to describe how many people view Christianity, view religion, and view the Bible. And um, legalism, the Bible refers to it as the letter. So people, people focus on the word, the written word. That's the letter. I do agree that God speaks to us through our thoughts and through inspiration and in other words. And that's what we mean when we talk about being led by the Holy Spirit. So I, I agree with what you're saying. You know, the word of God comes to us in that way the living word through the living word jesus christ so I, I i do appreciate that um further highlighting of the the issue but i'm out of time so i just want to appreciate everybody and thank you for your attentiveness and you know i hope that we didn't leave any questions unanswered but in case there is something that we really would like need to look at we can We'll take, a, we'll take a few minutes this afternoon before we go to the next study and we will answer those questions. But I'm just going to ask you all to please bow your heads with me now as we give thanks. <laughs> 